Hello and welcome back to another episode of Alec Mappa Hot Mess with Matthew Dempsey, psychotherapist. I'm Alec Mappa. I'm an actor and comedian. I live in Hollywood. And I'm Matthew Dempsey. I'm a multicultural counselor and psychotherapist. You are. You really are. I mean, I love introducing you because like, you're the real thing. You're not some shyster who just walked in off the street. You're like super smart. And I love doing the show with you because you always kind of give me an aha moment. Oh my God. Like yeah. high, high, high praise. Thank I've, you. I've had lots of aha <laughs> moments with yes. Matthew Dempsey, psychotherapist on the show. So today we're going to talk about breaking the cycle. We have an amazing yes. guest. We have Jolie Fisher, yes, superstar who I've known forever, and she's going to be on the show. Um, and uh, breaking the cycle, this is this is the cycle I want to break. Um, when I was 14, my parents lost all their money, and I went to live in San Francisco because they moved to the East Bay, mm -hmm. and I was basically on my own since I was 14, and I lived like an animal. Like, I was... <laughs> When you're 14, you, you're, I, if you're not a character in a Charles Dickens novel, yeah. <laughs> you're not supposed to be on your own. <laughs> right? Right. How are you on your own at 14? I'm confused. I was living with my aunt in San Francisco who could not be, who wasn't, who didn't want to raise a teenager, wasn't uh... concerned with, and kind of established from the thing that you, I, you sleep here, right. the rest is up to you. Got it. I okay. would call her if I was late at a friend's house. I would call her and say, I'm staying at a friend's. And she was like, okay. There was never any kind of like, who's the friend? Right. Who are you with? Yeah. What are you doing? So the cycle I wanted to break was my kids started going off the rails at 13. Mm -hmm. Same deal. Not that he was doing a bunch of drugs or anything, but it was kind of like something's going wrong. And instead of kind of like going by, you're on your own, I really, really pushed in right. with a lot of support. M my son was diagnosed with um, reactive attachment disorder. Mm -hmm. And it's what a lot of foster kids end up with is they don't feel, in layman's terms, they don't trust that their needs are going to get met. Yeah. They don't trust that they're safe. And so as a result, they resort to a lot of maladaptive behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, he has trichotillomania. That was, mm -hmm. um, you know, he was hair picking. Yep. Um, he had started to uh, shoplift as a way to relieve anxiety. He became very rebellious with me. Um, mm -hmm. There was a lot of theft, you know, and it was, it was, and at first I was like, what is going on? But mm -hmm. when I pushed in with supports, we found out that all of these maladaptive behaviors were, were a result of such a huge amount of anxiety and fear mm -hmm. that was outsized. Yeah. And these were things that he was resorting to in order to calm himself down. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, of course. So the cycle I was breaking was, I'm not going to kind of like check out when you're 14. I really, really, really pushed in because I didn't, one, you can't be a black kid and <laughs> shoplift and have rage issues. It's right. just, it's not going to work out well for you. And, mm -hmm. and, and two, I kind of felt as a parent, given my experience, that um, I knew that that was a crucial time. Yeah. Let me ask you how, okay, so that's amazing. I love how you've been able to kind of like frame that so that you can show up in a very different way, in a way that you needed when you were younger. So breaking the cycle in that way. And yeah. obviously, you know, with somebody who's adopted and also somebody who has these diagnoses that you have to be really mindful of and have kind of more attention to. Yeah. How do you strike that right balance where you really are showing up in a way that's really necessary without overdoing it and having the pendulum swing to the whole other end of the spectrum and creating a whole new problematic cycle? Mm, well, we kind of made it up as we went along yeah. because, you know, we were new to RAD, which they call it, reactive mm -hmm. attachment disorder. I didn't know what it meant. Um, so it was kind of a day-to-day -day thing. Yeah. All I knew was um, my son was in distress he was behaving in a way that he hadn't before and um it, and it was it, we were in crisis mode yeah and i think that um i don't know i i don't know if we made too big a deal of it i don't think we did i yeah. think we treated it with this is because he'd been a really compliant kid followed yeah. me everywhere and all of a sudden it was like wow this is he was volatile in totally. a way that he hadn't been before well, there's no perfect way to parent, of course, but the fact that you were even just really mindful of mm. trying to strike the right balance and showing up in, in the best ways that you could, like that in and of it, there's no perfect way to do it. So that in and of itself is already helping to break the cycle. And anytime we're talking about breaking the cycle of like family psychodramas, 
Mm. It's usually because things can be extreme one way or the other. Either things are like really kind of like problematic and people yeah. are kind of like hovering and too much or have, right. you know, mental health issues and substance use issues. Oh, or... I'm going to mess them up in a completely different <laughs> way. Trust. <laughs> or people are just like not available at all and are totally detached. And mm -hmm. so breaking the cycle really is about not having it go from one extreme to the other, but breaking the cycle of those extremes and really trying to hone in and practice mindfulness and practice a little bit more balance internally for ourselves and help ho hopefully passing that along a little okay. bit more. That's yeah. a good explanation. What would breaking the cycle look like for you? Well, breaking the cycle for me, I was actually thinking about that. I'm not entirely sure. I would probably say, and I hate to say this because I love my mom so much and she did, she did such an incredible bitch. job. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> t -t -t -t. Absolutely not. No, no, no. She, my mom was incredible and she had to do so much for herself. She had to mm. really like take care of herself because of shit that she went through in life. Mm. So as a result, she was really, really, really almost kind of like over caring and over attentive in certain ways in a way that actually protected us. So like oh, we, so we weren't like exposed. Like smothering? Not like that, but I mean like, you know, if there were, um, you know, close family friends who had like passed away or something, like we mm. wouldn't find out about it until afterwards. My mom was like, oh, I didn't want you guys to have to deal with that. And it's like, okay, oh, so oh. It, it, the intention was to really make sure that, that we were taken care of, but it right. kind of handicapped our ability to know how to show up for other people at times or to know how to be present and stay connected. And so that's mm. something for me that I had to kind of strike that right balance in myself and make sure that I was really kind of practicing that and, and being able to show up. I, that's breaking the cycle so for me. It sounds to me like you, in the description that your mother was overly protective of you in kind of like potentially emotional upsetting situations. Yes, yes. And do you think that that affected your, I mean, had she not been, you would have to be exposed to things and you would have to um, process things at a young age or yeah. do you think that what? it's affected your ability in emotionally upsetting situations um. now in handling them? Well, I would say it, it took me a while to learn how to actually do certain things. Like my mom did my laundry for me up until I went to college and you. would like pay all of my bills. And like, like I was the opposite of you. So she like did all that. And, and I would say like, mom, let me like try to do some of this. And she's like, no, worry about it when you leave. I don't want you, I just want you to focus on grades and doing that. Like that was her approach to things. So by okay. the time I got to college, I was like, I don't know how to fucking do laundry. <laughs> They're so handicapped. And so now, anyway, how so- how do I brush my teeth? Do I go back and forth or up and down? And do I wipe so... front to back or back to front, mom? I'm in Columbia, I have some questions. I know, so it took me, It. it what I've realized for myself is that I actually, I have a, I, I have a higher degree of anxiety in mm. just doing certain tasks and just trying to experiment and take risks in life it requires a lot more kind of like emotional awareness and tools for me to be able to manage that because it's because I didn't, I didn't get strong at that at, from an early age. So that's what I'm trying to <laughs> correct for myself and break the cycle for, well, I don't have children, but break the cycle for say my clients, you know, and get to help so them through that. What I'm hearing is that your mother turned you into an emotional <laughs> cripple who's incapable of handling conflict. That's right. But I break the cycle and now I'm trying to help other people. Here we are, right? We're breaking the cycle on hot mess real time. Hello. Hot mess real time. Listen, if you're new to the hot mess podcast, welcome, welcome, welcome. We love that you're here. And if you're a returning listener, thank you so much. Um, if you're new, don't forget to download and subscribe. It's, yes. We have so much fun and, and we're, we're, we're healing the world one hot mess at a time. And yeah. today we're talking with Jolie Fisher and we're going to talk to her when we get back from this message. We are thrilled to welcome our guest today. She's an actor, director, singer, and screenwriter. She is author of the book, Growing Up Fisher, and created and stars in a one-woman show of the same name. In addition to everything else she does right now, she's running for national leadership of SAG-AFTRA. She is an unstoppable force. Please welcome to the show our friend, Jolie Fisher. Yay! You Hi, guys. Hi. Thank you so much. You I put on pants for you today. <laughs> I know. And a little lipstick. Actually, I don't have pants on, but that's another story. <laughs> I don't want to go back to normal. I don't I know. I, I've lived in a tank top and Uggs for the past 18 months, and I, I, I don't feel like changing anytime soon. Have you been out? It's really wild. It's, it's really wild out. to go out. It stresses People me People are like, I'm vaccinated, and they come at you, and it's yes. like, blah, you know. Um, yeah. I'm, I, by the way, I was listening and I'm already learning. Like I've never heard of reactive attachment disorder. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. I mean, I've mm -hmm. heard them all in terms of one child that, that is struggling in my house. And it mm -hmm. sort of sounds like the, a similar situation. We've heard 
intermittent explosive. We've mm. heard oppositional defiance. We've Opposition, heard, yeah, that he was. Yeah. we were looking at um, oppositional defiance as well because we were experiencing a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a scary thing because she, the child that I'm speaking of is my youngest of five, and so mm. I had never. I, I felt like I had this amazing tool chest in terms of parenting, and mm. I mean, I was raised by wolves. So mm. I, I was trying to, I mean, not really, you know that, but. Um, <laughs> Literally, well, kind of. she's like, it's Literally. like a jungle book. <laughs> no, it really, really, really. I mean, like Hollywood uh, royalty style wolves. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, for the for people that are listening who may not know, my father was Eddie Fisher, um, who had, uh, you know, uh, emotional challenges. He was um, an, an addict of the, of the like utmost kind. He mm. was a drug addict, a, a woman addict. He was a gambler. He was, um, you know, just notoriously married and unmarried and just an amazing singer and talent, but he just- He sounds like a lot of fun, honestly. He, you know what? He, he must, was a lot he, of fun. Yeah. He was a lot of fun. Those kind of addicts are super charming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't get much of him as a child, so I don't think like my black belt in rock bottom comes from Connie Stevens, my mother. So mm. I had this sort of mixed bag, amazing um, experiences, trying to figure out who I was going to be as a woman. And then so now I guess what we're talking about is breaking the cycle for myself mm -hmm. and now for five other human beings that I was right. so... Um, uh, you know, I, I, the role of mother was like always, always on my mind, even with, you know, coming out of the womb, singing and, and being spilled onto a stage, literally martini mm -hmm. in one hand, Mike in the other. But I, um, but I'm listening to you and I, and I'm, and I feel like I, I'm already having a shift in, in kind of what I want to talk about. I don't know. I, mm. Yeah. Well, and, you know, my issue with was I was enraged at the beginning and that was my because that's the way I was raised <laughs> if I stepped out of line my parents went bananas I was raised by immigrant parents who had very little tolerance for any kind of like a defiance or anything so when my kids started uh, you know with all the shenanigans my first reaction was anger and then when we really pushed in and one of the therapists said to us is, I, I like to look at the behavior, but more importantly, I want to look at the why. I want to mm -hmm. look at why. Mm -hmm. And um, my son was, um, he experienced abuse in the foster care system oh. when, before he was, came to live with us when he was five. And, and like I said to Matthew, when he came to live with us, he pushed everything down. And then when he went through puberty, it's kind of like Pandora's box opened. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, um, what the therapist said, if we're looking at the why instead of actually what he's doing, he's, do he he's not waking up this morning and going, how am I going to fuck up the world? Right. How am I going right. to make la my parents as miserable as possible? He was doing all of that because the anxiety was deafening. Mm -hmm. And these were the only things. And also he was triggered. So whenever I told him no, because you're talking about oppositional defiance, he wasn't hearing no for now. He was hearing no forever. It was a right. day event. And so what we had to do was really push in and get him treatment to one anger management, finding out your triggers and just starting to process the PTSD, mm -hmm. just starting right. to talk about it. How old was he? How old was we, he when he came to you? He was five. Oh, so that's quite a bit of an imprint he had already gotten, right? Yeah. How old was your kid? I adopted her at birth. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I think kids can still get rad. Kid, kids can still have rad, even if they're adopted at birth. Well, I just, I always think about the pain that is, you know, some of the things that happen in utero is, mm. you know, I had two, um, I have two biological daughters and my whole pregnancy I spent calling them by their name and saying how much I love them and playing them music and dancing and being and touching and saying, mm. I can't wait to meet you. Mm. And this daughter never got any of that. Mm -hmm. She had, a, you know, someone, a young teenage girl who was like, I mean, thank God she was brave enough to not, I guess, terminate the pregnancy and, 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 and to relinquish her child to another family, which I told her she was so young. And I said, I feel like you're so brave. And I, I promised to care for this child. So 
I feel like um, some of that has to have been absorbed in mm -hmm. the belly. Of course. You know? mm -hmm. um, um, is there any, um, Matthew, in, in that, in utero, what is what have you found in your studies? Like how much are children affected in the womb by psychologically? Um, I don't know how to necessarily quantify that, but mm -hmm. um, but for sure, I mean, there's all kinds of things chemically. I mean, nine months you're inside of another human being. And so all the chemicals that are going on um, in terms of just the way that you're interacting also for sure is going to be impacting that child. How old, Jolie, how old was it literally from birth into your arms? Was there a, a, a few weeks or months waiting time? So No, I was the first okay. one to hold her. Yeah. 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 So now I got to be honest. Guess what? I also tried to nurse her because- I, it's such a, people were like, oh my God, it's, she's nursing her black baby. I mean, mm -hmm. literally it was like, people were like, what are you doing? Yeah. But I had another child that I was still nursing that I had just stopped. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it's like almost like I was a wet nurse. Like I was able to produce milk, which is wildly an off topic, but, mm -hmm. um, but we tried, you know, it wasn't very much, but, um, but, you know, to get that bonding experience yeah, at least a sure. little bit, you know? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, what I've gotten out of the past couple of years, my son's 16 now. The good news is um, he's going to have to deal with his PTSD for the rest of his life. But now he has coping strategies that he didn't have before because we really moved in. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he's he's 16 now. The good news is, is that. I, I think that he's going to be. Please to give me good news. The good news is <laughs> we, we pushed in with treatment. It was super scary. It was super awful. Um, but what I've gotten out of it, bringing it back to me, um, <laughs> is that I will never know what it's like to be him. Yeah. And I will never right. know what it's like to have had his experience. And, and, you know, I was really naive. I was a first time parent and I honestly thought, Oh, look how nice your room is. Look how great this house is. Yeah. Look at how nice our family is. That's enough. You should every, you should be comfortable and everything should be fine and everything, but we have no idea what's going on in our kids' heads. So the cycle I was breaking was I came from a family where that kind of stuff was dismissed and not talked about. If you're right. having a problem, figure it out. Just is stoic. That was my parents' generation. And this was was like, um, no. And it changed me. Yeah. It changed how I look at things. But I mean, it, it has was, it to, right? Nightmare. You can't like operate on the same frequency, uh, you know, keep and expect it to change around you and not change you, right? Right, right. Right. So you said raised by wolves. Walk us through that. Like, <laughs> it is, are you okay? In the you, wilds of Homeby Hills. In the wilds. <laughs> like, uh, how, how old are you when you have an awareness that my parents are celebrities. I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, immediately. I mean, my father was not around. So it, my my parents' marriage started with, we better get married because now we have a child, me. Right. And then it ended mm -hmm. with, now there's another child uh, and my mother caught my father with twins. So uh, she was like, baby on each hip, a diaper bag, a sequin gown, and went to a motel on Van Nuys Boulevard. It's wow. still there, actually. So she was like, you know, she probably, she still calls Eddie delicious. She was like, he was, uh, you know, incredibly charismatic, and he was just, you know, couldn't keep it in his pants. So, mm -hmm. you know, at, at some point you decide as a woman what your, what your worth is. Some event will change sort of the direction of how you feel about what you're what you're worthy of right yeah. so and my mother never married again she did have significant boyfriends she sort of went for the same guy um i had two sort of father figures in my life that were alcoholic i mean like mm. knock down mm. drunk um musician and then i made her choose between me and him i mean it was pretty ugly mm -hmm. wow. but but uh, but in the in the mix juxtaposed with that was a woman who was super affectionate and generous with her spirit and her you know whatever she could muster up after coming coming off the road and really working to sort of to support the family and she always felt really validated by you know her next gig and and what she, and what people thought of her and all that and i watched that right. as a child and i was like um you know, even though I wanted the same career, I didn't want that feeling. I didn't want the feeling mm. of like, I am not 
I am not uh, at worthy if I'm not like on the screen or the stage, yeah. right. which I, and, you know, cause it was like, you know, that's, you know, we do that anyway. It's like such a business of, it's a really you know, hard way to live. It is. It, it if is. you're in yeah. that mindset, then you're always a mess. It always hurts. She, it, yeah. it, she's still, still 80, almost three years old. And she's like, when am I going to get that Netflix show? I'm like, mom, right. soon we're done. <laughs> um, which she might have any minute, but, yeah. but anyway, you know, um, and she's beautiful and she's crazy and, you know, and, you know. Yeah. Um, she's gorgeous. You know, it's so funny. It sounds to me like you grew up and the spillover of your mom's life affected you. Im impacted you and it's so funny how you said I remember going to a benefit at your mom's house years and years ago and because we met through Steve Tyler yeah and I remember that the way your interaction was like just even briefly seeing you and your mom I was like Jolly's the adult oh yeah oh yeah I've been the mom since oh. yeah you're the, you were your, you're your mom's mom and I have a younger sister who's 14 months younger than me. So I raised her also and me. Oh, wow. I, we, I raised the two of us. Yeah. So, um, you know, my mom's like, that's not true. I was, all, you know, and I'm like, okay, you, you were like, you're grounded <laughs> and I'm going on the road for six weeks. I'm like, <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and, but by the way, like I, I kind of turned out okay. Like I did a really yeah. good job with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I've had my my ups and downs, and and um, and dealing with you know womanhood, and now like how we're breaking the cycle in terms of being a mom and still having a career. I think always working um, throughout like a lot of their young lives made me a better mother. It mm -hmm. you know it really did. Like they got to see me in my element, but I also didn't need to be on the set and say, this is who I am and, mm. and look at this girls, you know, watch that, watch me, you know? Right. Um, um, That's a I big cycle to break. That sounds like a really big cycle to break that you, your, your view of work and your mother's view of work are radically different. I mean, don't That's get me wrong. Like. I always want to be working and I oh, always am staying creative and all of that, but, it, but it, but I had, um, you know, sort of a, uh, I would say probably a decade of them pretty steadily as, you know, even when I was working, I was home for dinner. I was the last face that they saw. Yeah. I was there to, I drove them to school, you know, and on my way. And, you know, um, I wanted to do that because I didn't have that as a child. Yeah. I wanted to go to every play date and have the swimming lessons at my house and, right. you know, um, <laughs> yeah. Just be more Just, present. It yeah, I'm, like. I'm, I'm kind of curious because a thing a thing that I hear a lot um, is when people grow up and they've got parents who are performers or parents who are addicts and like that kind of thing, they then- Parents they, who are both. Right, parents <laughs> who are both. They then find themselves in this position, kind of like a little bit how you're describing where it's like, Jesus, it's like, I, I have to make sure that I'm the one who's kind of rising above and I have to be present and I have to take responsibility and even like now maybe take care of my siblings. And in a way through an experience like that, especially from a, from a young age, we can kind of like start to learn that my worth and my value is in taking care of other people, kind of being like this like superhuman, right? How through kind of then coming into adulthood yourself and being a parent, how did you strike that right balance where the scales didn't kind of tip in that direction. Hmm. Well, let's not mince words. I did ha do a lot of living before becoming a parent. And I did have, <laughs> it was the 80s. I, I did, um, <laughs> I did um, stay out all night on occasion. Um, but I, but I, um, I recognize that if that, it that it would uh, kill me if I didn't, if I didn't slow down, if, I didn't focus on my career and becoming, uh, you know, finding the person that I wanted to spend my life with and becoming a mother. So I did um, share in the predisposition for addiction. Mm. Um, mm. My, my sister, Carrie, who we all know and we all lost tragically. Um, mm -hmm. five, it's going to be five years ago, five years. Are you Maybe it's, me? Uh, yeah. Um, oh, wow. Is she called me a periodical, a periodical. Is that, that the, you know, that I was like able magazine? to, that I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that I was able to pick up and put down and, you know, go on, uh, you know, have a year of living dangerously uh, and then mm. say, oh my God, I'm doing a Broadway show. I'm going to, 
you know, not do anything and be healthy and that kind of thing. But um, it's not very sexy uh, of a word, but I think that I, you know, she was, she did talk me off a couple ledges because I knew that she would have the the least amount of judgment and the most experience. Mm -hmm. So I would call her and say, I'm in New York and I'm a little bit in trouble right now. And she'd say, come home, we'll go to a meeting. You know, like she, she was my intervention. Wow. Um, And then, you know, I was still kind of like, obviously when, when people reached out to me across the internet, people with mental health challenges, people with addiction, you know, she was notoriously bipolar and Mm -hmm. talked about her mental illness as, as you know, it was her, it was who she was. She did, there was no secrets. I'm not telling tales out of school. Right. And that whole solo show about it. Yeah. And that she, Mm. um, you know, self-medicated, um, And people reached out to me and they're like, what are we going to do now that she's gone? Because, you know, she said, if I can survive, you know, anybody can. And then she didn't, you know, that's like a, that was a traumatic experience. Like the world went off its axis, Mm. you know? Um, So I sort of have become like a, like a touchstone for some people out in the world, mostly young women who reached out to me and I formed friendships with them. I feel a responsibility yeah. Um, to and they, the, I'm called J Mama. I'm like the space mom in the Twitter sphere, and and I um, and I uh, gladly take up the mantle, the lightsaber in my hand, and right. say, "Okay, guys, I'll be your space aunt, and I'll take care of you." You know? Yeah. Um, because I need to. I need. I think I, I need to do it for myself too. Yeah, totally, absolutely. I mean, whenever we're able to offer anything and give support. That's incredible. I mean, that benefits everybody, including the person who offers it. How do you strike that right balance where you're able to be really present, really attentive and supportive, but also making sure your own cup is full first? You know, I it's that's the hardest part for me. That's the hardest part for me. And I and and, you know, not we want to stay evergreen here, but to bring it to the pandemic Mm. world is I think, you know, everybody's challenges, mental health everything was exacerbated yes. so tremendously in this extraordinary year that we lived through. Yeah. And like um, Alec, like my daughter, like this really, really cut to her, you know, brought her to her studs. You know, mm. she really had she? a hard time. She's 12. Mm, yeah. She's young, but she was, you know, she felt, you know, we all, I was like, I'm going to go have a tequila, you know, where she couldn't do that. She was right. reaching out on the internet. She, you know, there was a lot of things going on here in the house where I was like, whoa, mm. what do we do with this? Mm-hmm. So um, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, yeah. I, I, the answer to that is I, I probably didn't do it as well as I should. have. And I do have friends mm. that say, it, you know, the, exactly what you just said, you know, make sure your cup is full. And so I've, I let it get a little not full. Um, from time to time in the past year. And I'm just sort of like climbing out of that a little I bit. Like yeah. I mean, you have five. I had one. And I remember one time it was like, it was two years into us being fathers and we were folding laundry and watching television. And I was always going to be that. I thought, you know, I'm going to take care of myself and I'm going to make sure my cup is full. And I'm going <laughs> to put a, a spinning and yeah, yeah, yeah. And then two years later, 20 pounds heavier, mm. I look over at my husband. I was like, wow, we look like shit. <laughs> because, because it was a fire alarm, him yeah. coming into our lives. Yeah. And we dropped everything. And it wasn't until he was like, I'm not kidding, with us for five years or three years that we were like, <laughs> what do I need? Like, it's yeah. because when you have a kid, it's, it's, they have to come from, they, it's hard to make yeah. that balance. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to make that balance. It's hard to, it's hard to say to a, a five year old or a seven year old, yeah. um, you know, I just need a little space right now. Well, par- I parent- to- parenting kicks in and you've got, and you just have to do your thing and there's no perfect way of doing it. It's so interesting though, because both of you guys are actually kind of talking about like some paralleled kind of experiences that you each had in life where you grew up, you kind of inevitably had to take care of yourself, kind of find mm-hmm. your way through life. And then also become like both of you, they become these incredible caregivers. Right. And at times you can kind of go to the extreme where it's like putting other people's needs ahead of your own. Mm -hmm. But the way that you are each describing it is that you're just really aware of it. You're mindful of it. There's never going to be a perfect balance. Like, yes, fill your cup up first. And then everybody gets a spill over. Like, (laughs) that would be lovely. It doesn't really happen like that all the time. The fact that you're aware of it and you're trying to strike a very conscious balance of it 
that is breaking the cycle. That that mindfulness and conscious shift and change to try and find that balance is breaking the cycle. Right, right. And we have the similar experience of like adopting black children. And it's kind of like, I can give my kid everything except the experience of growing up in a black home. Yeah. I can give you everything. And I right. can give you I education. Had, I can, but I it's had like- a tr- a, Sorry, I had a troll on- mm-hmm. um, on Instagram, a couple ladies that were like, how are you gonna teach her how to be a black woman? And I'm like, I'm gonna teach her how to be a woman. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't, but I understand where they're coming from in terms of, you know, we didn't really think that part of it all the way through. We right. thought we are we are so open in this family. We've never, it, would, it wasn't even a question what color her skin was. We yeah, were like, when yes. When you send them out into the world, it's gonna be a different story. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then, this year happened where we were um, we were so vocal and so politically charged and you know not this year four years mm-hmm. frankly but so we were we had the news on all the time and we were mm. yelling and we were talking about it and we were you know it was just very uh, it was very charged in my house and I and I somebody said on the news your children are listening your children are listening. Mm. So they would come in and out of the room and they'd hear us and, and, you know, and they're all different. They have their own personalities. Like my other two daughters, my other sons are, are, uh, are adults and don't live here and have their own families and they're in Texas Mm. and they're uh, wonderful. And my other two daughters um, have very, very distinct points of view about the world. And they're just amazing human beings. And they, um, uh, they're fully formed to me mm-hmm. in a, in mm-hmm. a way, mm-hmm. whereas uh, my youngest child, um, was listening mm-hmm. and she was listening to the atrocities that were going on in the nation and taking it in and, and processing it by herself. Mm-hmm. And so that I, I said, come on, let's talk about what's happening. We talked to, we went all the way back to history and, and, and slavery and the way the country yeah. was built by black and brown people, but mm-hmm. not for black and brown people. And, mm-hmm. you know, we had to, we had to do that. My yeah. other, my oldest daughter planned a march just after George Floyd and my, and Luna came in and she made a sign that said, my life matters. And I was just mm-hmm. like, oh my God, oh my oh God, my oh my God. God. But, yeah. but hyper aware in a way that I'm, that I hope that we were able to, you know, to just disseminate the the right kind of love and attention and information. Yes, yeah. I mean, you're for sure absolutely setting the entire right foundation for this human being to come into the world and to feel loved and attended to and seen, seen on, you know, kind of uh, across the board and culturally and racially. Um, and also, I mean, it kind of makes me think about like when, you know, when I grew up, I grew up with straight parents and they loved me and they offered you know, acceptance and inclusivity and all that stuff. And some but education maybe- they didn't teach maybe, you how to go to a bar. Well, they just didn't teach me what the walk- Wait, are you like. gay? <laughs> 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 Ding. And so it's like, yeah, and they didn't, you know, they didn't teach me exactly what the experience of, and the walk would be like going through the world as a gay person with that mm-hmm. particular marginalization. I inevitably had to kind of like outsource. I had like mentors and kind of like gay daddies, you know, growing right. up. You know, and Alec, I know you've talked about how for your son, you have, what is it? We black- have this thing called Blacktivities. Blacktivities, right. Blacktivities, <laughs> where um, our, he has, he's surrounded by Black mentors. And it's certainly, we, we weren't able to do this during the pandemic, but he'll spend the day with a Black uncle or auntie, you know, close friends of ours, so that one, they can, uh, you know, it's, they can have the experience of not being the only black person in the room because mm-hmm. that's stressful. It's stressful when you're the only gay person in the room and you're the only woman in the room. And they can discuss things in a way that it's coming from a person who has that shared experience of being black. Mm-hmm. Because coming from me, it's like, well, what do you know? And then my black friends can go, yeah, no, he's right. You have to be careful with the police. Mm-hmm. You, you can't comport yourself. You don't have the privileges of acting out in ways other people do Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and it's it's what they give him is 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 a lived experience of it you know and and i've seen i've seen um, you know my son is 16 he looks older than he is he's bigger than me and i've seen the perception of him go from the cute kid who was being raised by two gay guys because he was adorable to a, a, a black man and seeing how other people perceive him and look at him and it's different yeah, and with with um, black females, 
you know, oftentimes their identity, especially, at, you know, going through teen, pu- puberty and teenage years, their identity may be wrapped up in their hair, mm-hmm. you know, which is mm-hmm. when, my, when my daughter was super little, she said, I want yellow flat hair because mm. my, my biological daughters look just like me yeah. and have yeah. blonde hair. It's like the Whoopi and, Goldberg sketch where she puts the shirt in her yes, head. Yes, the white shirt, yeah. 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 Ask a dating. <laughs> um, but you know, that was a thing where one of my actress, black actress girlfriends was like, girl, come here. We gotta fix this. We gotta, yeah, you know. You have to go to black um, hair care Cause school. we were like, oh, look, it's so cute when it's in dreads. No, Mm-mm. you can't do that to the child. You have to let the child decide if she wants to have dreads when she's old enough to decide. Right. So we, you know, it, we spend lots of money and lots of time and, and, yes. and make it beautiful braids if she wants. And now yes. recently she said, recently she said, I want the braids out and I want to try natural. And I was like, all right, uh, you know, you do you. So she yeah. is searching for that. She's searching for that. Well, she's searching for that. But also the fact that both of you, again, what you're describing, it's like, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to, you know, be like a you know super parent because you, you, there's no way you could be. And so breaking this, breaking that cycle to show your own children that they don't have to have all the answers, that they can, you know, kind of fumble along the way and figure things out. And that's part of being human and okay. So my God, you guys like full circle or breaking the cycle. Break the cycle <laughs> on the hot mess podcast. You know, it also sounds to me, um, uh, Jolly, you talk about like how different you and your mother are and how she looked. It, it's almost like you having a black daughter almost parallel. I'm not. It's, it's 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 a parallel experience. It's not the exact uh, experience, but your mother was. Uh, you said that she was. You know, she's a movie star and she was professionally skinny and growing. I up- want like okay. I don't even know. I didn't really plan this, but like yeah. this is when I was a teenage girl. That oh, wow. was my wow. mom. Yeah. You know and. Jolie's holding up a picture right now and she's oh yeah, yeah and her mom is stunning. of my mom, mom in, a co- in a fur coat with nothing underneath it um right. yeah. and that's basically <laughs> as one does you know, <laughs> as one, you know, yeah it gets out a, under there yeah. if you're a 60s sex kitten yeah. and she um you know everybody she she she's incandescent i mean she walks mm. into a room and everybody goes connie's here Kinda and that was my whole entire life yeah and, um, you know, we hate to interrupt your dinner, but could we? And I was like, they already interrupted our dinner. So why, <laughs> why are they asking, you know? And then, um, you know, I really did look like her as a child. And, and Trisha will say, my sister Trisha will say, and I look like Eddie, um, which, you know, we kind of switch off and what we look like as adults now and whatever. But as, as a child, I was blonde and I had the light eyes and um, I felt... I internalized looking like her, but not mm. feeling like I looked like her by putting weight on. And so I had this like very strange body dysmorphia, not strange, I guess it's normal for a lot. It's, you know, for a lot of women, but I, you know, I fought it, but I'm not going to be compared to her. I'm going to mm. be different. Yeah. And, and I had to work through a lot of years of therapy myself to understand that you know, I was given the body that I was given and it's curvy and it is what it is. And, um, and now speaking of breaking the cycle, I'm hoping that my three daughters recognize that I have come to terms with my adult body and who Mm. she is. And she's, and she's fierce and she pushed out children and I made children in here. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? It's like, and I do also understand the power of the pussy and the boobs mm-hmm. and the sexy mm-hmm. part and whatever. Like I always got that. I got that from when I was a teenager. I understood that there that there was power in walking to a into a room, and I watched it. Ha- and I was like, oh, that works. I'm going to try a little bit of that. Mm. So it's like a yeah. It's that was a modeled lot. for you. Are yeah. you are you are you modeling pussy power for your girls? <laughs> Do you think that's part of who you are? Just like I walking think- into a room because you have your own celebrity. You have your <laughs> I mean, you've been on television you know, for so Luna, long. Luna, when I was going out so one day, Luna goes, "Mom, Mom, I can see your boobs." And I said, "Do you want nice things?" <laughs> <laughs> you like I don't. I don't know. I, they're they're so used to it <laughs> that I think they go the opposite way. I don't think I'm. I I think they're forming their own opinions about about what girl power is and you know that my you know they're they're activists and they're 
concerned with social injustice and hey. righteousness and um i'm just i'm proud i mean that that they did get from me you yeah. know we never stop marching we yeah. never stop um fighting for uh, marginalized people and i think that we um we we love the military we love you know what i mean we i got that from my mom i'm forever uh you know in support of of well, and like you said, sometimes spreading myself a little bit thin and forgetting that I need to take care of myself because I'm yeah. trying to mother the planet a little bit. <laughs> it's, yes. It's, it's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh-oh. A lot. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. breaking the cycle. It yeah. sounds like you've like, there's, there's a lot of, it sounds like between you and your mother, there's a lot of forgiveness. I think that that oh, yeah. part of breaking the cycle too is is uh, you know looking at my parents. Um, one time, my therapist said to me, "Wow, in, in, in hearing about your parents, you didn't have a chance." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> given the people that they were, they were not prepared for you. So um, I, 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 being a parent myself, I view my parents with so much compassion and forgiveness at yeah. this point. And I that's think huge. that's part of breaking the cycle that's as huge well. for That's huge for breaking the cycle. It's like that quote that goes, resentment is allowing people to live rent-free in your head. Um, so mm -hmm. figuring out how to evict them <laughs> by forgiveness and really practicing that because otherwise, if you don't forgive, then you're kind of like, you know, clinging onto these resentments and trying to prove things and all that stuff. And then we don't have the ability to practice self-love and to be able to find more of that balance internally. That's the thing we want to pass along to, to our children. That's how we break that cycle. I did have this incredible catharsis, not to like, you know, plug or whatever, but I got to write my story. I got, I, you know, I, w I wrote plug an it. article. Plug it. Okay. I wrote an article <laughs> in uh, the Hollywood Reporter and uh, when my sister Carrie died and it was, it was, um, it was just, I was backstage about to go on stage and I scratched out this thing and, and, and it came to me in, in a very, just a, a, such an authentic way, but it, it also was written well. You know, I, I mm. felt like I, 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 I found the words to describe something that everybody was feeling and, and especially uh, us and the family. And I said, you know, you can't write R-I-G-H-T this shit, but you can write it. Mm. And mm. I said, and boy, do I have a book in me. And then I got book offers. So I said, am I ready to do this? Is there a book in me? And, and I was like, fuck yeah, I, yeah. I, let me, let me start. It's not, it's, um, so the catharsis was writing a love letter to my family and saying how there, but for the grace of God, go I, that I got this experience, that I have this incredible experience that sometimes has been really hard. And I write about the hard stuff and I write about the crazy stuff and I write about the, the love stuff and, um, and what it, what it, when people say, what's it like to grow up in a household like that? And I'm like, I don't know any other house. Mm. This is, this is how I grew up. This is, I have the same problems in different square footage, you know, as mm. everybody, but mm. if it's, if it's, I bled on the page, you know, I did, I really yeah. did. I wrote my story and, and, um, and there's no, I'm a truth teller. So, um, I, I broke the cycle a little bit in, yeah. in, 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 when I wrote it. And I yeah. think that we, we in this family, um, well, I'll say the women in the family, you know, we, we use our words to, to navigate the tough stuff. Like Carrie yeah. was the smartest brain we ever so knew. Fast. You know? Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I, I saw her show live and then I went to the premiere of her show at, uh, cause world of wonder produced it and they invited me. And I remember us going to the screening and before she even opened her mouth, she said, I'll just get out of the way. My mom's here. Stand up. <laughs> and I was like, that is a unique experience and relationship. That's it's it, that's wacky and amazing. Um, but also, but also like there, there, we do that to pay homage, mm -hmm. but we all have our issues with our moms. You know what I mean? They yeah. did. They, they, they were from an era where like that thing meant something and that you did like sort of, honor the elders of our tribe in a mm -hmm. way and mm -hmm. she could still have you know the complaints and the hurts and the you know the stuff that that we i think we all talked about it though like in postcards from the edge when when she, when meryl streep climbed on top of her and the host, uh, shirley mclean 
on in the hospital bed and said the paparazzi's outside you mm-hmm. i need to give you eyebrows and all that yeah. and it was so it was funny but it was also like we were we had this reverence for and respect for our elders of and, their journey so, and what they yeah. went through to get yeah. to the place where i'm curious what's your what's your mom's relationship like with your girls oh she's amazing i mean yeah. she's you know they they I think she wants them, which is so weird to say, but she wants them to see a little like vintage Connie Stevens, which they didn't really get the experience of seeing her Mm -hmm. um, on stage. I mean, they've seen like her in a a few movies and things like that, but they don't really know like what an, I I mean, they know, but they don't know, know what an icon she was. Um, And she, I think, feels like she wants them to know that. And it's hard for her to do that at 83 years old. And right. um, so I, so she wants me to remind them and I'm like, okay, mom, I'll remind them, you know, <laughs> but they're, they, you know, they know where they come from and yeah. they love her. She's on the Muppet show. I watched her on the Muppet show on Disney plus True yesterday. Story. Mm-hmm. She's True. a very <laughs> special guest star. Well, you know, I want to talk to you forever. I want to take your face and hug <laughs> <laughs> you and just, because this is the first time we've ever talked like this. We've worked yeah. together a bunch of times, but we've never, it's, it's always been so rushed and everything. We've never gotten a chance to hang out. Um, we usually end the, um, the, the program, our fine program with, with a hot <laughs> message for people. So um, what would your message be to anyone who's kind of stuck in a loop of, of behavior or, or relationship, like to break it, to break that cycle of repeating the same things? Me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the expert? Yes, the yes. expert, the, mo- the the space ant, the mother of all, the mother of of all things. I mean, I hate to like hammer it out, mm. but I feel like I need to. Writing, write yes. it, wow. write it, write yes. it, write it. Yes. You know, like I get up in the middle of the night sometimes and 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 go onto my notes on my phone, and I go, mm. oh my God, I just had a weird dream, and I'm going to write this, and what did that mean in the morning? And I have notebooks everywhere i wrote my book longhand the whole book yeah wow and then said here can somebody type this because i suck at typing (laughs) and uh i have the same tech problems as you do alec mappa (laughs) but i am full analog like this is my this is me like i'm like writing all day long i you know and i think it is like a trip like there's you're not gonna lie in your own hand in something mm. that nobody's going to look at, right? Yeah, you're not going to lie. You're not well, writing it for. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I, I, Matthew's when I pull- a big proponent of writing. I mean, you talk about how it just rewires your brain. Yeah, it really, really it really of- does. But Jolie, specifically, I'm not even sure if you're even as conscious of it. But what you've described is exactly the right way to do it because you're not only writing things down, but you are choosing very consciously the way in which you're framing things. So to put that positive framework on it while still honoring how you felt the emotional experience is, is perfect. And I feel like I've been doing it my whole life. Like I have journals that I pulled out when I started to write my story. I pulled mm-hmm. out and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I wrote that. I can't yeah. believe, well, that sounds pretty much how I feel right now. Or, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> or, oh, I can't believe that, that that girl who was tortured by that boyfriend at 22 years old who felt like that. I don't feel like that at all anymore. Wow. Yeah. She was, you know, she was a hot mess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I think, you know, um, memorialize it. Yeah. You know, chronicle it. Wow. Well, yeah. I love that. Great advice. I love hot you, Jolie Fisher. Where I can love people you so find much. You? Where, where, where can people find you on the social medias? Oh, at Ms. Jolie Fisher, M-S-J-O-E-L-Y-F-I-S-H-E-R on Twitter, Insta, and I don't really do Facebook anymore, but I'm pretty mouthy (laughs) politically on the Twitter, and I Mm -hmm. like to show pretty pictures on the Insta, so. Yeah. Same. same, Perfect. And if you're you're in SAG-AFTRA, the upcoming elections for Matthew Modine and Jolie Fisher are in August. So get your ballot and fill out the bubbles that say membership first, Fisher Modine. Modine yeah. Fisher. I'm, I'm voting for, I'm a part of the Fisher Modine ticket. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> vote and tell everybody to do the same. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, I really appreciate Such it. Such a you. great way to spend the morning. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew, this is like another, like another j- great journey we've been on together yeah. in, in 45 minutes. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was amazing. What's your hot message? Honestly, I was like so prepared. I'm like, what's my hot message? And then Jolie said the writing thing. I was like, damn, I was gonna say that. Um, so um, I'll just, I'm just gonna echo that. Write it down. Write it down. Be conscious. Uh, we're always telling ourselves stories, whether we're conscious of it or not. So when we make the practice of consciously writing them down, then we have the choice of how we want to frame it. And when we can frame it, then you know, with a more positive spin on it, that's how we then can heal. And that healing is what we get to pass along instead of any kind of trauma or psychodrama from from previously. And that's breaking the cycle. Wow, breaking the cycle. And then someday I'm going to be a little old Filipino man and my <laughs> big black son is going to be like, wow, you really screwed me up. <laughs> <laughs> and here's my here's my therapist, Bill. Yeah. Um, <laughs> My hot message is it's okay not to know everything. It's okay yes. not to have the answers, but um, but to all to be curious is I think is is the sweet spot. Yeah. To be curious, to kind of wonder about things, to sit in awe and wonder of the process and and kind of be at peace with not knowing we're not supposed to know everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where can people find you on your socials, big boy? <laughs> you can find me at MJ Dempsey Psych on Instagram and Twitter and Matthew J. Dempsey Psychotherapy on Facebook. You can find me at Alec Mop on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to download and subscribe. Download yes. and subscribe. Please, please, we're please. getting more people every week, and we're we're so grateful Love it. that you choose to spend your time in the car, at the gym, wherever you are with yes. us. Tune in next week for more hot mess fun. Goodbye. Bye, guys. <laughs>